okay, this is one world. And maybe I should give you a reference. A reference is uh, uh, Shimura's uh, paper in Duke. I should have looked up the year. Uh, give me a second and I'll tell you. It's in the 80s sometime. Duke, uh, sorry, 1978. It's a paper called The Special Values of Zeta Functions Associated to Hilbert Model of Forms. And it starts with a very nice, uh, uh, beautiful summary of uh, uh, Hilbert Model of Forms. I Is it possible highly, uh, to zoom this page a little bit? Zoom the page. My fingers. Yeah, it is getting better. Hmm. Okay. Uh, alternative is just right bigger because once you zoom, of course, one will eventually yeah. lose. So the, I know. I, I put some... it in the landscape mode. I, it's okay, we'll see. We'll see. I, as I start writing, I uh, okay. I'll, I'll try to zoom uh, as I write. That's so. This is one world, and so such an object, which is a, a holomorphic Hilbert model of form, which is uh, primitive eigen new, uh, which is primitive, meaning eigen form, new form, normalized, such a thing corresponds to, so there is a bijection here, to uh, an object, I'm going to denote pi, which is a cuspidal automorphic, representation of the adelic group GL2 of the adels of uh, the totally real field. And such that, well, you want to see this data, the K, the N, the omega uh, for this object. So the way it shows up is this is a certain representation of an adelic group, it's factorizes and there is, uh, there is a part of it at infinity, which is, It's a tensor product of representations running over the real places. The real places is no different from uh, uh, this, the set of embeddings. There is a canonical bijection of that with the set of real places, Archimedean places. And each one is a representation of GL2R. And this pi sub V, if this V were to correspond to a tau, now remember, I'm just giving you an overview. So. Uh, you want to take this, this is just the bird's eye view of what I want to talk about as I get in, before I get into details. So if this corresponds to uh, an embedding tau, then pi v is a certain very special representation. I'm going to denote this as a d k tau minus one, forget the minus one for the time being. This is a discrete series representation of GL2 R. So the weight of the Hilbert model of form, you will see uh, in terms of some data uh, appearing at the Archimedean components of the representation of the automorphic representation. The central character is nothing but the, that, uh, the nebentipus, the omega or the idealization of that omega tilde. And uh, I don't know if I'll ever talk about such things. There's something called the conductor of this representation, which will see the level. So this is, a certain certain world in which you can operate. Okay, so there is this uh, the classical world of holomorphic Hilbert model of forms on which there is there's an entire Hecker theory that you have to understand, and you pick eigenfunctions there. They correspond to a purely uh, harmonic analysis world of uh, harmonic analysis on uh, adelic groups, where we talk about representations, and th there is these two are the same things. It's just it just gives you a different point of view. And this contributes to what I will just uh, sort of maybe somewhat loosely just call the cohomology of GL2. Let me just put down some notation here. I'm going to be particularly looking at cohomology in degree D, where D, D is the degree of the extension. 
uh, of my totally real field of a certain space. This is uh, a locally symmetric space. S, which depends on the group at hand, which is GL2 or F, and it depends on this uh, level N, that integral ideal. This is your, uh, so to speak, your upper half plane modulo a discrete subgroup. And since I'm working with the Hilbert modulo form, it's a product of upper half planes modulo a certain kind of discrete subgroup. And with coefficients in some sheaf, uh, M mu tilde, that mu is to stand for a highest weight, which gets parameterized by the same uh, embeddings, the real complex embeddings of F, and each mu tau will look like, one has to worry about the parity of the integers. It's like K minus two by K minus two by two, and it's negative. Again, a certain highest weight, what I want you to take back with this OU picture is a certain highest weight which has in it the information about the weight of the Hilbert model of form. Okay. Uh, and if you recognize, uh, you know, if you're familiar with these kind of things, it is, this is really K minus two times half the sum of positive roots for GL2. Ragram, or directly, yeah. Sorry, when you or, write the K tau, do you just mean that the K depends on tau or is there any other meaning? Yes. Yeah, so right in the beginning here, uh, the k, the symbol k is really a string of integers, k1, k2 through kd, parameterized by, you know, maybe you can parameterize by integers j between 1 to d, where d is the degree of the extension, or a little more sort of intrinsic without fixing any ordering on the embeddings. For every embedding of f into complex numbers or f into real numbers, you have an integer k tau. Okay, th th this is... Okay. Sorry, Maybe equality is to be better. So I just I... or directly you could go from here to here, which I won't be talking about. Uh, but you could. Uh, I mean, if you buy so far these uh, three bubbles and those uh, some arrows there, uh, formally at least there is an arrow in this direction which lets you attach a holomorphic Hilbert model of form some kind of a cohomology class on this locally symmetric space for GL2. And this is exactly uh, the eichler shimura isomorphism. The, the cohomology groups have to be uh, qualified a little bit. This is not the full cohomology, but inside the cohomology of that space, for this overview picture, maybe you even forget the sheaf. Let me just look at cohomology with compact, uh, I beg your pardon, cohomology with constant coefficients. In that, I got to qualify this a little by asking for so-called cuspidal cohomology, okay? So this is a discussion of, will be a discussion of the objects which uh, in, in my talk. One other objects, and then you can ask about, you know, what do I want to do with these objects? And you can go in, you know, many, many different directions. Uh, I see that on Thursday, there is a talk on uh, Galois representations attached to uh, modular forms uh, by Sudhanshu. Uh, that also uh, has been generalized to Galois representations attached to Hilbert modular forms. Or if you really like algebraic geometry, you want to be talking about motives attached to Hilbert modular forms, which is a deep theorem of Richard Taylor and independently due to uh, Blasius and Rogowski. Modularity is happening in the other way. Supposing I had a two-dimensional Galois representation coming from something else and uh, under certain conditions, is does it look like the representation attached to a Hilbert model of form? Uh, you can ask questions like that. Uh, my own interests have been uh, the special values of L functions you can take this Hilbert model of form and then uh, you can look at its Mellon transform. You get an L function and given any L function, like for the Riemann zeta function, you can ask for its values uh, at various points, interesting points and ask for what sort of information can I expect in those special values uh, and so on and so forth. So there are just many, many different directions you can take off uh, once you have made your peace with these kind of objects, okay? So now I'll, uh, what I'm, particularly going to uh, talk about uh, uh, today is just give you 
a little bit of uh, you know just some details of uh, this holomorphic Hilbert modular form, and I want to talk about uh, this a little bit about uh, the sort of cuspidal automorphic representations, and I really want to lay my hands on one aspect of these kind of the so-called discrete series representations, and I I want to introduce the context uh, of this bubble, the cohomology of GL2, or this is a part of a more general subject called the cohomology of arithmetic groups. So that's where I'm headed. All right. Any questions so far about this? This was an, this is an overview of what is to come. Uh, you're all welcome to please stop me. Uh, feel free to interrupt even if I'm in the midst of something to ask questions. So now uh, let me talk about holomorphic Hilbert model forms. I already mentioned this paper of uh, 1978 paper of Shimura and Duke. The other reference which I particularly like is uh, Paul Garrett's book uh, called Holomorphic, uh, Holomorphic Hilbert Modular Forms. This book has unfortunately gone out of print. Uh, I have told uh, Paul Garrett a few times that somehow we should get it reprinted. Uh, there is a wealth of information in that book and I, I have a photocopy of this book and every now and then I go there. Uh, Anyway, so to get started, I, I continue with my baggage of notations of F being a totally real field, my embedding, the degree, the ring of integers, the integral ideal, and so on. The first thing, I, the next thing I need is uh, I need what's called the narrow class group. I'm going to denote that as a CLF plus. This is the narrow class group. Class. So what's this? Uh, I can think of it in terms of ideals. I take the ideals of F, modulo principal ideals, modulo uh, on the other side, uh, the Archimedean part, which is just product of real numbers with every component being positive and non-zero real numbers, I want ideals. And I throw in the full level. So over all P, OP cross. This is the, idyllic way of thinking, or uh, classically you think of ideals, model of principal ideals. So you take the group of uh, fract fractional ideals of F, I'm going to denote that JF, and I go modulo principal ideals, which are generated by an element which is totally positive, okay? The narrow class group, and this was kind of the first time I came across this, narrow class group is actually bigger than the class group. In the class group, I go mod all principal ideals. So the narrow class group canonically surjects onto class group. Okay, it can be larger. It's larger by some power of two usually for a totally real field. And I'm going to let uh, H stand for uh, the order of the narrow class group. Usually H is the class, the class number, but I want the narrow class number here. And we will need a bunch of uh, representatives of this. Uh, so I'm going to denote T sub nu as nu runs from one to h, uh, representatives of the narrow class group as elements of uh, ideals. And uh, I one asks for the Archimedean components to be all ones. So that's, uh, you, can, you can forget that. So it, I'm meaning for this kind of a talk that these things, such details won't play a role. So I take a bunch of representatives of the narrow class group. And you will see why we need to do this. You know, many people who prove theorems on Hilbert modular forms, there are two kinds of assumptions, simplifying assumptions, I, and I dislike both of them. People prove, prove a theorem, let's assume the class group, the class number is one or the narrow class number is one. And that's just uh, being a little bit lazy, that's all. And or the other kind of thing is, you know, you prove a theorem for a modular form for a full level, and then just leave it at that. And then someone else has to come along and generalize it with, to general level. And with Hilbert modular forms, you can do full level or you can do take all the cages to be equal. That's called a parallel weight. So there are all these simplifying assumptions just to uh, 
ease out on the technicalities. Uh, none of them are really interesting. You'll never see Shimura making these kind of assumptions. Okay. Uh, the level structure is given by this integral ideal uh, n. And to n, I'm going to attach uh, an open compact subgroup k0 of n. This is going to be a product uh, over all p of kpn, all uh, finite prime ideals. And kpn, uh, uh, I see that I'm going to hopelessly run out of time. So I got to speed up a little. This is roughly like upper triangular modulo the highest power of p, which divides n. Okay, so these are, I'll, I'll simply say this. The Hecker congruence subgroups. And then it's an easy, uh, if you like dealing with these kind of idyllic uh, things. Uh, if I take the, the group of, uh, the idyllic group for GL2 over F, this is, a, it's a, this is an exercise really. Uh, if you haven't seen this, you should really dirty your hands with this. This has, it decomposes as a disjoint union over the representatives of my narrow class group. And which is why that narrow class group plays a role of the principal in a GL to F times this kind of representatives T nu one times the Archimedean part, which is uh, I run through uh, the Archimedean places of for GL two R uh, plus and uh, throw in the level structure of Raynaud. So this is really, later on, I'm going to be looking at certain double cosset spaces, certain, a certain locally symmetric space, and its connected components will be parametrized by this narrow class group. So that's, that's, the, that's the way this, uh, this decomposition is gonna play a role. And if I take this level structure, this K not F, K not N, so, Maybe I should just say K naught N. This lives in GL2 of the finite ideals of F and it's an open compact subgroup. And you do the usual kind of thing. You intersect this with, uh, you know, you, you get yourself an, a, a discrete subgroup uh, inside GL2 R or but here really uh, GL2 F. And you'll get one for uh, each of these elements in the narrow class group. So this gamma, gamma nu, well, it depends on the N, is some conjugate of like this. One T nu, I don't know, I just wrote this from some previous notes. I haven't checked these as I prepared my talk. So maybe the T nu needs to get replaced by T nu inverse, I don't know. So maybe I'll just put that in red somewhere. You have to figure out these things. Maybe there's an inverse T nu inverse, I don't know. Uh, yeah. uh, in which case, this conjugating element will also might be a little uh, different. May this or its inverse. Product over V Archimedean GL2 R plus the same K naught N times the, the, the conjugate of that intersect GL2 F. So these are uh, my discrete subgroups. By definition, these are congruent subgroups. So I built it out of this K naught ends. Right. Now I have the ingredients to talk about uh, the space of weight K holomorphic Hilbert modular forms for this discrete subgroup uh, gamma nu n with Navintipus omega or omega tilde. So, what does this mean? Since you've already seen enough about modular forms, I'll, I'll just zip through this. These are, in modular forms, you, you start with a holomorphic function on the upper half plane. So here, there's a, it's just a product of the upper half planes, D copies of that, D being the degree of F over Q, uh, holomorphic. Such that the usual, the stroke operator uh, F hit by any element gamma in this district subgroup uh, looks like omega tilde gamma F. And I got to explain just one tiny point about the stroke operator, since I've already seen it for modular forms. For modular forms, there's like one variable. Here, there are D variables. We just got to keep track of uh, the D variables. And you just use, uh, uh, you just have to be aware that 
that there is a multi index notation. So F stroke gamma on Z. What does this mean? It's determinant gamma to the K by two, the usual J gamma Z to the minus K F of gamma Z. Let me just qualify this. So you use the multi index notation. So for example, uh, determinant gamma to the K or K by two is really the product running over all these embeddings tau determinant tau gamma, gamma lives in GL2 F, you embed it inside GL2 R via tau, take the determinant and you raise that to the, that's some real number. I raise it to the power uh, K tau by two. Because right, I could have let my K is being negative, but somewhere down the line, you know, some basic, uh, you got to put together basic observations and it suffices to look at K tau as being all positive. Uh, and similarly, the J gamma Z is a product running over tau, J of tau gamma and uh, the Z, Z lives in this H to the D. Uh, so, I could think of the Z as uh, Z1 or maybe a bunch of uh, Z taus, all indexed by taus as an element of H to the D. So Z tau. And this is, the, that's the usual cosicle uh, CZ plus D for that after you take that embedding. Okay. So this is this multi-index notation, which you have to be clear about. And if you set up your notations, keeping the multi-index notation all the time, then it looks almost exactly like what you do from usual elliptic modular forms. So when you talk about modular forms with no, quali with no qualifying adjective, one often means elliptic modular forms, meaning your base field is just Q. And especially if there's a Hilbert situation, then you'll talk about uh, Hilbert modular form versus an elliptic modular form. Raghura, maybe you said it, but uh, there should be a moderate growth condition or something. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I. Uh... Or maybe you don't want to see it. <laughs> yeah. So I don't, I don't, maybe I don't want to see it. <laughs> so with less growth. It's holomorphic at the cusps. Okay. So I'm, I'm kind of getting there. Uh, and so such a Hilbert model of form, there is a, there's a Fourier expansion. Which is just abelian uh, Fourier analysis. Uh, uh, and that's going to look like, so my F again is an element of this MK, one of these discrete subgroups and uh, what else did I have? Omega or omega tilde. Uh, and the Fourier expansion takes the shape f of z is a sum over xi, sum coefficient a nu xi e to the two pi i xi z. Again, all this is, this is, this exponential here is multi-index. Okay. And the xi is going to run over, uh, it depends on the representative T nu of that particular, uh, the nu is always uh, going to be a symbol for some element in the narrow class group. You take the ideal uh, generated by the T nu. So you take the representative simply as an ideal class uh, and then you look at uh, the totally positive elements there. And so once I have this Fourier expansion, I can talk about the space of cusp forms. S k gamma nu n omega tilde is so in f in m k lives in s k if the the zeroth Fourier coefficient is zero. So in other words, it vanishes at the cusp as you go towards infinity. It's uh, it vanishes. So this translates to a nu, the zeroth coefficient is zero. If xi is zero, then the corresponding coefficient is zero. And this should happen not just at infinity, but all the possible cusps. So for all uh, f moved around uh, by elements of uh, 
the rational elements in GL2F. So this we can, you know, there can be many cusps and you, you want it to vanish as it goes towards uh, all the different cusps. So once I have these ingredients, now remember all this was happening for one, for a given new. So you first define it for a given new in the classical way. And now in, in Hilbert modular forms, you got to be a little careful with this when the narrow class group is can be uh, is non-trivial. Now you define the space of, uh, so this is my space of holomorphic Hilbert modular forms. Cuspidum is SKN omega tilde is the direct sum over nu going from one to h. So parameterized by my narrow class group and you pick a cusp form for each of these discrete subgroups. Here, this is going to be my bold face F. This is all Shimura's notation. This corresponds to F nu, nu going from one to h. And what do you do? I mean, how, how is this correspondence, this F, where does it live? It lives as a function on the idyllic points. So that's G is GL2 here. GL2 AF. And how do I get uh, the component for new? Well, I take an idyllic point, G in GL2 AF. And you have to think in terms of this decomposition here. Where did it go? This decomposition, which I said is an exercise. If I take a G, then there exists a unique new given G there exists a there exists a unique new such that this G looks like some rational element, this T new element, maybe with an inverse and some Archimedean part K infinity and a KF. Okay, so I sorry for squeezing that in. I should have mentioned that earlier. So this this G looks like a rational element, a unique T new and then some Archimedean and some finite part. And the value of this, uh, this idyllic version of this um, holomorphic Hilbert modular forms, which now is a function on all the different connected components. Okay, I'll talk about connected components when I talk about locally symmetric spaces. So it kind of lives on all of them. And there's some uh, the elements which will jumble around these uh, connected components. So this is, you pick that unique new, and then you take that new component, F new, which is in all, which is the classical thing I've described about. So all these previous Fs were really F news now. And you stroke it with the Archimedean, uh, I'll call it K infinity. Wait a minute, it's better to call it G infinity because this uh, this this is an element of GL to R plus. So this is, I should call this G infinity. And you stroke it by G infinity. This now is a function on the upper half plane, well, product of upper half planes. And you evaluate this on I, the element I, uh, you know, I, 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 in the product of the upper half planes times, and you tweak it by the central character, uh, this omega tilde, uh, the finite part of the data character on KF. So this is what you do. So there is a, you do, something for every connected component, very similar to the classical elliptic world. And then you kind of put them together uh, using this idyllic decomposition. Okay. And I want to talk about, uh, I won't talk about Hecker operators on all this. There is an action of uh, various Hecker operators. And then uh, there's an, the Hecker theory has to be put in place. Uh, there's a Peterson uh, in a product. So these are self-adjoint, blah, blah, blah. You can, uh, you can find eigenforms and then as a basis of eigenforms, what I just want to lay my hands on is notationally is just the Fourier coefficients. So for uh, every Fourier coefficient I've already talked about for every connected component and now for the global thing, the Fourier coefficients takes this shape. You take any integral ideal M and to this, there's a Fourier coefficient. This integral ideal parameterizes a Fourier coefficient uh, of this uh, bold phase F. How do you get this? You take your integral ideal M, and I don't seem to have written it in my notes. Uh, anyway, so this M, it's an ideal, 
integral ideal. In particular, it's a fractional ideal. It represents a certain uh, element in the narrow class group. And say the narrow class, it, it, uh, it represents some uh, something given by that, and the representatives were T nu. Well, it's this up to some principal ideal, so up to some xi. Okay. And maybe the, the maybe there's a little bit of uh, throwing in an inverse. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I didn't check those details this morning when I was preparing this talk. I apologize. But you have to be a little careful with the T nu or T nu inverse, some standard idyllic kind of exercises uh, for some xi totally positive. And so I got a new, I got a xi, and then this is this Fourier coefficient is really the the Fourier coefficient uh, of that f nu, the a nu for xi, and uh, you know you kind of take some sort of normalization of this xi to the minus k by two. So that's just some normalization. Is the usual? Do I work with an or do I uh, in the classical uh, modular forms? Do I work with an or do I tweak it a little and look at an times n to the minus k by two or something? It's just just that. I'm following Shimura's uh, notation and normalization here. And we are going to ask for uh, this F to be a weight K holomorphic Hilbert cuspidal modular form. I'm going to ask it to be primitive to mean the easy thing to talk about is new form, which I, I'll just say, I won't write this given any level. It's, you know, if, if this ideal divides another ideal, then I can always take this canonical map and inflate it to uh, get myself a modular form for a deeper level. Uh, so I, I don't want to consider that. I want this thing to honest, honest and goodness live on with level N. So that's a, such a thing is called a new form. I want it to be an eigen form for which I have to talk about Hecate, these operators, it's an eigen form for all the operators TP and uh, some normalization uh, that for the, the how do you normalize in the elliptic world? You just say a1 is uh, one and uh, a sub one, that one is now the, the full integral ideal, that corresponding uh, F, uh, th that corresponding Fourier coefficient, we'll ask it to be one. So this is one object of study, okay? In this talk, I won't uh, talk about how to this object, there's a way to, uh, well, it's already a function that lives on GL2 AF. And so it's not uh, so uh, such a stretch of imagination to think that this generates, if I look at some suitable function space living on the Adele group, this, and I take the, I can look at the representation generated by this. So that it's not uh, so far-fetched to imagine some representation that this boldface F will generate. That's what I want to next talk about. I'm still pretty far removed from cohomology. <laughs> I suppose we introduce that context. We'll see how far we go. This is space. Uh, SK is the finite dimensional, right? Yes, this is this is finite dimension. Yes. And like classical case and discord. Like similar. classical case, it is the uh, or similar these things made of proof. genus and other things. Say, say this again. It is for similar geometric regions for like in yeah. the classical case. How to see yeah, that? Very much. The, all this is all this is very special case of a very general theorem of Harish Chandra, by the way. Okay. If you if you have some, you know, if I fix some infinity type and I fix a level and I fix the center, uh, then the space of functions of this kind is finite dimensional. There's a very, very general theorem. So it's you, Harish Chandra would have, uh, that's a purely function, function theoretic uh, kind of argument. I mean, ultimately, I suppose it rel rel relies on the geometry of this locally symmetric space. So cusp, what you're just saying, genus and cusps and so on. Yeah, okay. It's finite dimensional, fact of life. What is the dimension? I, I don't know. And you don't have, yeah, I, I just don't know. I'm sure there's a wealth of information about dimensions. I just don't know the top of my head. So I want to talk about now uh, the world of uh, representations. What kind of representation will we look at? So the buzzwords are, I want to talk about what are called cuspidal, automorphic representations. Okay, so I'm going to I'm already 43 minutes past the hour, so I will have to 
Okay, so I'm, I'm going to slightly simplify on my notes, which I have some handwritten notes here. So one needs to, uh, actually defining this is a bit of a pain. Okay, so I, I'll just say that there are such objects. I'm going to look at the space of, a certain space of functions on this idyllic, uh, so G is now a simplified notation for GL2. I look at functions on GA mod GF, what kind of functions this is a very technical definition it just uh, i need a full hour to talk about this uh, the, i can't do better than just tell you to go look at uh, this paper of burrell and jackie uh, in corvallis i know i've squeezed it in there but i'm just saying this uh, there are several properties there are certain growth conditions and certain regularity conditions uh, that these kind of functions need to satisfy and such a function is called an automorphic form uh, and as you can expect, you see this, my construction here, uh, my boldface F uh, is a function which lives on GL2 AF, and then it is gamma invariant. There's no gamma there on the left-hand side of this, uh, this equation here. So, uh, so here is a function, okay? And which, which is going to satisfy all these properties. So inside this, uh, so this is, these are what are called uh, Automorphic forms. That A is for automorphic. I'll just I'm going to put a, put down a diagram here. So I want the less I write, the better. Inside this lives a space of what are called cuspidal cusp forms. What, what sort of automorphic form qualifies to be a cusp form? This is exactly the analog of the condition that the zeroth Fourier, I beg your pardon, the first, the zeroth Fourier coefficient is zero. So there, the way to talk about this here is uh, that if I take a take an F there, it lives in this, it's said to be a cusp form if a certain integral, or maybe since I'm just working with GL2, I can just, uh, 1x01 g dx integrating over af mod f this should be zero this is the this integral is picking up for g equals identity the the zeroth uh, cusp form a uh, zeroth Fourier coefficient so you want that to be zero so this is the defining property a technical artifice in dealing with these guys is to look at not just this full space of automorphic forms but I slightly cut down my attention by looking for automorphic forms with prescribed central character. So that omega uh, omega continues to be the same omega, or maybe I, I, I said omega tilde, the idealization of my uh, Dirichlet character. So the, this omega tilde is just a hacker character of F. It's a character as a continuous homomorphism from AF cross mod F cross. So this is a central character. And then I can intersect these two spaces, spaces of automorphic forms with given central character and those which have this cuspidality uh, condition. And I can look at the space of cusp forms with given central character. This is just the intersection of those two. So just this is... By the way, Raghuram, you didn't want to quotient by ZF a center? That will make it trivial central character. Yeah. Oh, ZF. Uh, it's kind of automatic since I've put this omega tilde and omega is a hacker character that will that will get taken care of. Yeah. Um, you mean in the for the automorphic forms here, I should have put ZF? Yeah, no. Well, ZF is contained in GF, so I, I don't. Sure. Know. Okay. You, okay. You mean you mean ZA? I, I mean, mean I mean ZF. I meant ZD. That's what I meant, not ZF. Yeah, but ZA I don't want to do because I want to allow myself general central characters. So I'm really, you know, bare bones, what am I looking at? I'm looking at some function on GA, uh, some complex function. And on the left, it's invariant under rational elements. On the, and on the right, it's uh, the central character is going to pull out. Plus my growth, plus regularity. Do I look at smooth? Do I look at continuous? You know what? What it's, there's you have to put these things in place, but bare bones is a certain function space living on the ideal group, which are invariant under principal ideals, 
and maybe with some central character condition. And it's a deep, deep theorem that the space of cusp forms this. Of course, I, I didn't say this. This is a on the left, I've cut out by GF. So it's a GA mod GF. There's an action on, uh, there's an action on all of these by the idyllic points by moving it on the right inside the argument of that function. So as a representation of GA, this is a direct sum of uh, irreducible representations. Irreducible representation of this big group, the Adeli group. And these are such a representation is called a cuspidal automorphism. So what's the cuspidal automorphic representation? It's an irreducible representation of my ideally group, which appears as an irreducible summand of the space of cusp forms. And uh, technical artifice is to work with cusp forms with given central character. And the point is that F, the previous F that we talked about, uh, this guy generates and for that, there are some details to put in place, which I won't standard. My paper with uh, Naomi Tanabe has all these details, generates uh, such a guy. I want to talk, say, I want to say some things about this pi. Every, so this guy lived where this is in the space of cusp forms of some level and some. Uh, character omega tilde. Some people say it's a Nabin tupus character that uh, I think uh, goes back to Hecker's terminology. It simply means something on the side. You know, Nabin in German is uh, something on the side. And it's a character on the side, so to speak. Uh, and uh, it's a good baggage to carry along with you. In any case, what I wanted to say was all these, the data, the K, the N, the omega or omega tilde should be visible at the level of pi. And I want to just talk about the K part of it. So the, if I have a product of groups, let's take two, two groups, abstract representation theory, and I have an irreducible representation of a product of groups, an irreducible representation is in fact the tensor product of irreducible representations of the constituents of the product. So if I had a huge product, this idyllic product, it's some kind of huge tensor product. But then you got to be careful with all these infinite tensor products. And then there are theorems to put in place how you make sense of that infinite tensor product. Model all that, if I, I just focus my attention now on the, on the representation at infinity, which is the local constituents, the tensor product of the local constituents uh, coming from uh, uh, that pi. So each of these pi sub v is an irreducible representation of GL2R. And what sort of representation is this? So I want to introduce you to that, uh, the sort of representation which shows up. So I'm going to, I need to talk about discrete series representations. And this is, I need a few details here. So this is a separate little development. Uh, so I'm going to take two integers, let A and B be two integers, one bigger than the other. For any integer, such integer, I'm going to denote by chi sub a, the character of R cross, this is in C cross, which sends an element t to t to the a, just raise it to the a-th power. And then I, I have a certain character, uh, I'm going to denote chi a twisted by half times chi b twisted by minus half to be a character of this Borel subgroup inside GL2. It takes such an upper triangular to T1 to the A, that's the chi sub A times absolute value T1 to the half times T2 to the B, absolute value T2 to the half. Forget the normalization, oh, sorry, minus half. Forget those normalizations, it's T to the A, T1 to the A, T2 to the B on the diagonal elements in that order. Suppose I did this, and suppose uh, I induce from the Borel 
uh, in GL2 to GL2, this particular character, chi A to the half, chi B to the minus half, then this induced representation fact, uh, this breaks up, it's not irreducible. It has two irreducible sub quotients. It has in fact a unique irreducible quotient, which is finite dimensional. And a unique irreducible sub, which is necessarily infinite dimensional then. You get this. This finite dimensional representation that you get is exactly the representation. I'm going to call this M sub mu. If I package those uh, two integers A and B in that order and call it mu, then M mu is the irreducible finite dimensional representation of, of the algebraic group GL2 uh, with highest weight mu. Okay. So any the stat and, and what is it? You can explicitly describe this in terms of the A and B. This is the symmetric A minus Bth symmetric of the standard representation twisted by the little calculation you got to do, twisted by determinant to the B. So you get a, on the, you can tell exactly. It's so all this fin typical finite dimensional representations are quotients of induced representations. And the sub, this infinite dimensional piece, this guy, this guy, I'm going to denote this as a D, D sub mu. D sub mu, and I'm, I'm just defining a notation here. This is going to be denoted as D A minus B plus one. Don't worry too much about those normalizations. Twisted by absolute value A plus B by two. So you get something like this. So A is bigger than or equal to B. A minus B is non-negative. A minus B plus one is positive. So this equality here for every integer k, I've gotten a, a certain irreducible representation dk, which appears up to this twisting and shifting as a sub of a, as the unique sub representation, unique irreducible sub representation of an induced representation. So that exact sequence there, you know, let me just suppressing some notations, just denote this as a d mu sits in some induced and the quotient is m mu. This sequence doesn't split. So in some suitable category of representations, this is, is an element. I get an element of X1 in some suitable category. I'll just call it GK and I'll explain what G and K are a little later. It's an extension. It's a, you should think of these unit extensions. It's a, a one extension and you have to keep track of the order. So the quotient comes before the comma and M mu comma D mu. So it's an element of X1, M mu comma D mu. And if I push the M mu on the other side of this uh, comma sign, the little exercises with X computations, then this is X1 between the trivial representation and M mu dual twisted by D mu. And X1, in, you know, th this is, what is this? This, this is the derived functor of the, you know, harm trivial comma whatever representation. So this is literally group cohomology or some GK cohomology here. So this is, H1, the GK cohomology between D mu, I, I can change the order there, uh, D mu and M mu check. And the example you need to know is. Uh, can I ask you? Yes. Uh, so we view M mu as GL2 or representation by restriction, right? It's a GL2 series. That's right. That's right. I suppose I is this Mihir? Yes, yes. I, uh, I don't know what I did. It says I pinned myself. Okay. Uh, that's right. So it's a representation of GL2C, which I have uh, just restricted to GL2R. And uh, when one develops the arithmetic theory, you have to be careful of these fields. Uh, at this level of uh, discussion, kind of giving myself the freedom okay. to be less. So the example you want to know in the classical world, so in the elliptic model of forms, if I have a, a model of form of weight K, which is literally an integer for say gamma naught N and some Leventippus, 
then this guy uh, generates a representation pi and then the pi infinity in this notation is literally dk minus one. Again, the shifting is, don't worry about it. It's a certain discrete series and here is this construction of discrete series. And if I were to take a Hilbert model of form, which is what I've been talking about, this generates a pi, which now is uh, its Archimedean component is a tensor product. So this looks like d k1 minus one, d k d minus one. So the take home here is given this Hilbert model of form, which needs to be primitive, the cuspidal automorphic representation it generates has for its Archimedean components, very interesting representations, which have non-trivial cohomology, okay? What cohomology, that some of the context will tell you what cohomology is. And now I see that I'm done with uh, my hour. I, let me just say what I wanted to do and I'll pick it up from here in my second talk. Now I want to talk about this whole thing in the context of cohomology of uh, locally symmetric spaces for GL2. So these representations, the representations whose Archimedean type part is the, built from this discrete series contribute in certain way to the cohomology of locally symmetric spaces. So this will take at least 15 minutes to just pick up all the baggage of notation I need to even talk about the object. Okay, so uh, maybe I will pick it up here in my next uh, talk. And once I have these basic ingredients in place, then we can talk about, well, what do you want to do with these ingredients? And for that, I will go towards L functions and the special values of L functions and how we, once you have this cohomological context all laid out, how uh, you can hope to prove theorems on the special values of L functions. So this is, uh, I'm up for questions. Okay, so maybe we should thank the speaker first. I don't know. Okay. I think uh, I underestimated the time needed for picking up the baggage of notations. Yeah, the Hilbert model of forms always has you know a huge amount of stuff. If it's just elliptic model of forms, you can get there a lot faster. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, anyway, any questions? So. So is MU irreducible as GL to R representation? Yes, it is irreducible. The MU, you see, the GL two <coughs> is a split is a split group. It, I mean, it works uh, okay. over Q. Actually, is even uh, works over Z if you if you like group schemes and all. And uh, if I take uh, so, if I were to take uh, GL two Q, and I look at uh, the standard, what does it act on? The most so the tautological representation is Q2, okay? Mm -hmm. By just matrix multiplication. Take a two by two matrix, hit it by, on a column, two by one. Once it acts on Q2, it acts on any symmetric power, any sim, uh, sim N of Q2, mm -hmm. which is an N plus one dimensional vector space. And since I'm working with GL2, uh, I, I can allow myself uh, some twisting by determinant, uh, determinant to the N. Okay. Mm -hmm. Exercise for you, every irreducible representation of Q uh, of GL2 over Q defined over Q is of this shape. Okay. And once I have this, uh, so it's really, I got a group over Q and I have a sort of Q morphism of where V is that vector space. And then I can base change this to any any field. Yeah. Okay. Once it it's is, absolutely, yeah, once I, I should say this is an absolutely irreducible representation. Every base change is the Okay. And then your question gets answered there. Mm -hmm. And actually, for arithmetic applications, once, once uh, when I get into setting up my cohomology context, uh, it is good to. Uh, in fact, this is a point of view I've appreciated a lot with my through my work with Harder. You want to work with as minimal a baggage. You want to start with Q or maybe some, at most some splitting field of that totally real field F and then and then you can base change to any field that you want. 
So this, you know, so complex numbers are not really needed to set up the cohomology complex. Mm -hmm. Uh, any other questions? Uh, just a small comment I have. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Earlier you mentioned like that it is true that it is a laziness when uh, we considered the class number one and then go on. But the yeah. label for the full label and versus the deep like uh, label. Yeah. So the, for the full label, I think that there are some other complications, right? So sometimes I consider that when you want to talk about the deep level, then also it becomes some laziness because you want to avoid the complication which arises from the torsion when you take the, the full level, right? Agreed, uh, agreed. Yeah, so, uh, you know, sometimes I see, not sometimes, I have seen papers uh, on L functions, yeah, special values, twisted L functions, what have you, where the starting object is uh, a modular form of weight K for SL to Z. And then uh, nothing really stops you from looking at modular forms of weight K of some level. And, and uh, sometimes people just don't do it. You know? yeah. So sometimes it is necessary. Actually, uh, you know, there are, in fact, you know this very well, uh, Ash and Gunnels and so on, they have looked yeah. at the cohomology of say SL3Z or that's SL4Z, right. yeah. not, not, not some deep enough congruence of it. So when you that's right. really want to say something on the nose for full level, this, uh, the calculations are very hard. Mm -hmm. uh, so I agree. It's not always laziness. Sometimes there is, there's something interesting and there are additional challenges uh, if you're were working with the level. I agreed. Okay. For there are no further questions. I guess we thank the speaker again. Yeah. And uh, I'm not sure how I'm, yeah. I'll leave it to the organizers now as to how one is supposed to proceed. Okay, thanks Professor Lagunathan also to chair this talk and Professor Agunathan for the wonderful exposition. Yeah, sure. Can I, oh, maybe I you can stop the live stream? Yeah, yeah, you can stop. Hi, Kirsi. How are you?